Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I think I know most people here, but if I don't, uh, my name is Adriana Link, and I am Assistant Director of Library and Museum Programming here at the American Philosophical Society. Uh, I'm very happy to welcome you, uh, both in person and those of you streaming online, hello, uh, to this afternoon's program. Uh, welcome to today's lunch at the library with Sam Muka uh, on Keeping Jellyfish, Gendered Labor in Marine Animal Husbandry. Uh, today's lecture is based on material from her recent book uh, that was published uh, from University of Chicago in 2022, uh, Oceans Under Glass, Tank Craft and the Sciences of the Sea. Uh, and if you're here in person, we actually do have a few copies at the back of the room that are available for purchase, and, and Sam is willing to stick around a couple of minutes extra to sign them if you would like to, to buy one after the talk. Uh, I'd like to begin today by recognizing that the American Philosophical Society resides in Lenape Hoking, the homeland of the Lenape people, whose ancestral relationships and connections with this land continue to this day and into the future. The APS wishes to express its sincere thanks for the past and ongoing generosity of numerous indigenous communities and individuals throughout this continent who have offered guidance, expertise, and opportunities for collaboration that make the work of the society possible. Uh, so I think we, most people here have been here before, but if you're joining us online for the first time, or if you, this is in fact your first time here, uh, the American Philosophical Society was founded by Benjamin Franklin in 1743 to support the promotion of useful knowledge. Uh, election to APS membership honors those who have made significant contributions to science, the arts and humanities, and public life. The society promotes research by providing over a million and a half dollars a year in research grants to individuals uh, who are working on projects spanning the arts, sciences, and the humanities. And our library and museum collections and research centers serve scholars and visitors from across the globe, uh, including projects like this one. So please check out our website, uh, www.amphilsoc.org, uh, for more details about who we are and all of the various things that we do. Uh, today's program, I know, it's a lot of housekeeping, sorry. I know you're just, enjoy your sandwiches. Um, today's program, too, uh, also complements the APS Museum's current exhibition, uh, Pursuit and Persistence, 300 Years of Women in Science, uh, which is now open, uh, if, you, if you haven't been, it's right diagonal across the street. It is open now through the end of December, and it's really fantastic. And I think the story that you'll hear today in, in the presentation really complements a lot of the themes uh, that are in the exhibition. And if you're curious about more information, hours on how to visit, uh, please do visit our website for that as well. Uh, our afternoon event also uh, falls into our continuing fall programming series on the topic of women in science. And our final public lecture on this topic will be held on Thursday, December 14th at 6 p.m. and will feature historian of science, Catherine McNair, uh, who'll be talking about her book, Mischievous Creatures, The Forgotten Sisters Who Transformed Early American Science. And more details about how to attend that event and the other things that are going on are all available on our website as well. Okay, so with those preliminaries aside, and I hope you're enjoying your peanut butter and jellyfish sandwiches, uh, I'm very pleased to introduce uh, today's speaker. Uh, Sam Muka is an assistant professor of STS at the Stevens Institute of Technology in Hoboken, New Jersey. Her work focuses on the development of technologies that help humans understand and shape the submarine world. She is currently researching the development and deployment of artificial reefs in the coastal United States. And as I've already mentioned, her book, Oceans Under Glass, Tank Craft and the Sciences of the Sea, was published by the University of Chicago and incorporates many materials, uh, particularly from William Innes, who is a Philadelphia-based aquarist, author, photographer, printer, and publisher whose papers are here at the APS. So it's really a delight to welcome Sam back here to the APS, uh, which really served as the, the original core uh, of this project. So Sam, I'll turn it over to you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, is, it, is it noon? Awesome. Perfect. OK, that feels right. Um, awesome. Uh, so thank you for having me today. It is true. The APS actually was the first uh, archive that I went into as a graduate student. And when I came to graduate school in Philadelphia, I was actually, um, I wanted to study the history of medicine. So I went into the eugenics collection. Um, and found um, a eugenicist who happened to really be into the eugenics of fish, uh, which it's, it's a thing. 
Um, and so piggybacked onto that, and that's how I actually entered into the history of marine biology. So the APS wasn't just William Innes collection. Uh, Philadelphia in general was kind of a really beautiful early aquarium. And so the city in general has a lot of fish um, archives, but the APS in general actually took me from a historian of medicine to a historian of marine biology. So it's an even better tale. Uh, so let's see. Um, so today I'm gonna talk um, about a, a chapter, chapter three in my book, Oceans Under Glass. In general, the book deals with how knowledge about the ocean is created. And so um, it might sound like, you know, the question that everyone asks, how is knowledge about the ocean created? But in uh, history of science, we're used to looking at laboratory work or observational work where people can spend their time doing that kind of work. Um, and the ocean is just not like that. Okay, you can't spend an enormous amount of time observing. Most things actually move, um, and you can't see how they move. Um, and experimentation is very difficult uh, in that uh, situation. And so if that is the case, how do we figure out what is in the ocean, how it lives, and kind of um, other things we wanna know about it? My first kind of idea about studying this was to think about spaces, right? So where scientists meet, uh, boats, which is very popular in the history of marine biology and history of oceanography community. Uh, a lot of people in that community love boats. I shied away from them for a couple different reasons. One is that I don't really like to be on boats. They make me incredibly sick. So I was like, I think, I think it's probably somewhere else if I had to guess. Um, and so instead I really gravitated towards marine stations and marine laboratories. This seemed like a great place. There were a lot of people meeting there in the early 20th century and beyond. And it, there was some work already done on it. And so I just went ahead and wrote a whole dissertation on that uh, subject. And at the end of it, I thought that is not right. Marine stations are super important to the way that marine science gets done, but um, they're only catching a small group of people, people, which is academic biologists most of the time. And what I was seeing is that knowledge about the ocean comes and goes in academic communities. And so sometimes um, you find there's a whole bunch of stuff going on at a public aquarium or in a hobbyist community, and it does eventually make its way into the academic community, but most often it doesn't grow up there immediately, and often it's not used there all the time. So someone in an academic community can say, oh, they're doing this at a, you know, a public aquarium and that seems really useful, uh, but we can't really do it in the laboratory just yet. We can't control variables and we don't quite know what's going on. Um, and so I felt like I wanted to find uh, a way to get at all these voices. Uh, and what I found was aquariums were the way to do that. So instead of looking at space, I wanted to instead follow a technology that everyone was using and talking about. Um, I really, really love this picture. <laughs> um, and it's the first picture in my book. Uh, this is the... Um, there was a large oceanography project for 10 years. And uh, this is on Lizard Reef, which is in Australia. And they're using this portable aquarium to view things at night. And when I saw it, I was like, well, that makes total sense, right? Um, all of these debates about field science versus laboratory science, they're really meaningless when you talk about aquariums because they're just this weird, squishy little thing. Um, so aquariums, there are three groups that I pay a lot of attention to. Uh, and they have so much overlap, it doesn't make a lot of sense to distinguish between them. Hobbyists, academic researchers, and, and aquarists who work at public aquariums. Um, you would think that they're distinct groups, but I follow a lot of people that start out as hobbyists, they end up working at a public aquarium, and then they get a PhD, or they work for the fisheries service. Um, and then, for a lot of the people who make a big difference in the field, they go from working in those locations back to private industry. Right, which I put in that hobbyist group. So it's, it's kind of an overlap that, that means that those terms are sometimes meaningless, sometimes not. The hobbyist community is coherent in some ways, um, which I'm not gonna talk about today, but I'm happy to answer questions about, right? But they have their own epistemological kind of basis of knowledge production um, that I take really seriously, right? They're not amateur scientists, they're hobbyists, and I use the term pretty consistently. What makes aquariums special is that unlike other forms of knowledge production 
uh, pieces of technology which are required in fields, these cannot be standardized. So the most standard that I could get, if someone says, what is an aquarium? When I was posting my book, they said, you really got to figure out what an aquarium is. And I was like, that's probably pretty helpful because I'm writing a whole book on it. And the most that I could say is that it is a box that is visible from four sides, sometimes from the top, that has moving water sometimes, right? <laughs> that's not even a good, and you're going to hear, like, people are like, does the water need to move? I don't know. Um, it's really difficult to standardize them. You can take the same animal and in a different location do different things to keep them alive, right? So they're geographically very specific. Um, and part of that is because it is a requirement that you just work with the environment that you have, okay? So if you're in a building and someone has an aquarium uh, on, of guppies you know, in the basement and someone has an aquarium of guppies on the top floor, they are gonna have to tinker with those tanks to get them to survive, right? And a lot of that tinkering is a type of craft knowledge that you can't write out into a paper. So instead you just say, I have these guppies and I kept them alive, right? Uh, so on Penn's campus, they have millions of zebrafish, but there's someone who's keeping those tanks alive by tinkering, and you would never know that in the publications, right? Because it's just the type of knowledge you could possibly tell people. I, I went into those laboratories, and someone was like, well, these uh, xenopus, they're like a frog. They really like it when I play music to them, uh, but only in October. Right? And I was like, oh, that's great, right? And if you've ever seen them, by the way, they look like they're smiling all the time anyway. So I was like, they love this music, right? Um, but the laboratory next door, like, they don't have any fake plants in there. And the laboratory over there, they have a bunch of fake plants and they play music. And none of that is something that you're ever going to read about, right? So the technology is not standardizable. It's not also something that you can really get a handle on. It's really, really quite difficult. Um, for you to be able to trace that type of knowledge production. It's really widespread and inexpensive, and one of the reasons I really love this community is that you get a lot of props for doing things as inexpensively as humanly possible, which is like right along my alley. I read a dissertation once, and two pages of it were about how all of the technology that he used in the dissertation he found on the side of the road. <laughs> And I was like, that's really useful to know. You get a lot of, you get a lot of props for that. It's a, it's a humble brag. Um, and it's also that aquariums facilitate knowledge through movement of people very specifically. So if you can't explain to someone what you've done, you have to show them. Okay? The aquarium works as a boundary object, and we I'm, certainly love to talk about it because it can be a little bit of a um, sticky phrase. Um, but what you find is that, especially in the aquarium community, it doesn't matter who you are, you go to the person who has that knowledge and you watch them, okay? So if someone says, I know how to keep jellyfish alive, you go ask them how, and then you have to watch them do it, okay? Um, and a lot of times that'll be saying, here's what we do with the tank, but here's what we're looking for. Here's kind of a minute tell on if something is upset or not. Um, so I went into the field, I did a lot of interviews, and basically just asked people, like, who do I go to talk to, right? Who did you learn this from? And what's really funny is that part of the book, uh, people would tell me that they learned things from people, and then I would go to that person, and they would say they learned it from the person who told me that they learned it from them. And I was like, how is this happening, right? But in some sense, it's because um, it's really hard to remember uh, and it's about kind of physical movement as much as, as about kind of written movement, which is hard as a historian of science. We're kind of used to following written stuff. It's more difficult to follow humans. Today I'm going to uh, just give an example. Uh, the jellyfish tank here, which is uh, a chrysal tank is what it's called. It, it just means um, movement like a top. Um, and I'm just going to talk a little bit about how the tanks were developed how they work to generate knowledge about the ocean, but more importantly, kind of what they have to tell us about gender, labor, and expertise in marine science. When I first started working on jellyfish, I visited um, a university to do some interviews, and someone came up and they said, you know, if you wanna find women in marine biology, just go towards invertebrates, because that's where they all are, they're in invertebrates. It is true that um, 
now as I work in coral, there are an enormous amount of uh, women academics in coral research, actually, quite a lot in the laboratory, um, and that's distinguished by people who keep coral in tanks who are almost all male engineers. Um, it works for me because I work at an engineering university, so it makes it look like I really belong there to always be working on engineering. Um, but jellyfish tanks are a little bit different. Uh, there are two kind of sides to the work, and they are gendered and also have a tendency, um, one side to be primarily men working on that grouping and one side primarily women. So in the tank engineering side of jellyfish tanks, you get a lot of men. This is building life support systems to maintain jellyfish. Uh, and it's a lot of tinkering with building materials and life support variables. So water chemistry, light intensity, and water flow very specifically. All, and I'm just using the word jellyfish here, they're all distinct in their species and there are some that are not jellyfish, they're siphonophores. Um, but if you have any questions about that, you can let me know. But for convenience sake, I'll just call them jellies for now. Um, they, every single different species of jellyfish requires a different water flow. Some of them, like, very quick. If you were to go to the Camden Aquarium right now and look into a tank, um, if you had two different jellyfish on either tank, uh, it would look like, you know, this one really likes to be in a washing machine and that one is just laying still. It took forever to figure those things out, and that's part of this particular work. Most of the people who build, who build these tanks are retired engineers or interested in engineering more generally. So if you go into an aquarium, a lot of that work is volunteer work and the people who do that volunteer work are re like retired engineers. Um, the aquarium that I was embedded in in Florida, there were three men that were just there all the time and all three of them were retired engineers from GE and that happens a lot. Um, and they talk about the work that they do as something which is just kind of an offshoot of that. Um, I was at a university and the, the person who was the tinker in that laboratory, I asked him how he built a jellyfish tank and he said, well, I built my own house. Um, never do this in an interview, but I was like, are you a jellyfish? <laughs> um, <laughs> to which he was like, why do you ask? And I was like, well. <laughs> um, but this seemed totally normal for him to say, of course I built this type of tank. I have built a house before, right? So it's often very gendered male, it's very masculinized uh, tinkering in the laboratory. There's often a tinkering guy in each laboratory. Animal husbandry on the other end, um, which is work with the organism to understand the physical and emotional needs of that organism. And I say emotional because jellyfish, not quite so much, but some animals in the aquarium, such as octopuses and other animals like that, do require um, uh, kind of um, tactile things. They like to play games and stuff like that to keep them mentally healthy. Um, this group tinkers with food, population numbers, and timing of support variables. So lunar cycles are very important to spawning. Um, water temperature is important to spawning. Often um, this field has a tendency to be populated by women, and it's considered gendered. It's kind of a caring labor um, in the industry. It's also the labor that often falls to the wayside uh, in citation because it's considered, after it's figured out, kind of common knowledge. Um, and I'll talk about that as we go. So the kind of genesis of this tank is E.T. Brown's plunger jar in 1897. He worked at the Plymouth Laboratory in England, um, and he saw people really, researchers in Plymouth wanted to use um, jellyfish for a couple different reasons. One is they were just interested in the evolution of organisms, right? And jellyfish were considered to be the earliest organism um, with a, a kind of neural network. They have um, nerves that go all over their body, uh, but they regenerate very quickly. And so people wanted to work on nerve regeneration with them and also the evolution of the nervous system. The problem was is that if you took them out of the water and you put them in a tank, they could live for about 24 hours, but they certainly were not thriving. And then they would develop lesions, they would sink to the bottom of the tank and they would die. And jellyfish death is really gross. <laughs> um, someone described it, most invertebrate death in aquariums as um, a creation of kind of a bullia base of invertebrates. So yes, very disgusting. So what he wanted to do uh, was figure out why they were dying. And what he noticed is that when he was looking in the water, 
the jellies actually were not working very hard to keep themselves up. They were just floating, right? And so he decided that he would try to make a technological system that would allow the jellyfish to float in the tank without settling on the bottom. And he settled on this plunger jar. It's got on one side of it a treacle tin, and it's weighted, and then there is a piece of plate glass that you can't really see. It's got a hole in it that goes in and out of that large jar on the other side. And so it's like a big lever. It goes down and up, and it just keeps the water kind of moving up and down. Uh, when he put jellies in here, they lasted between 18 days and six weeks depending on the variety that he put in there. And after six weeks, he had to go back to university and he was like, sorry, jellyfish, I have no idea what's going on. So at the end of his paper, he said, maybe they'll live longer, I have no clue. Um, he wasn't particularly interested in what they were eating. Um, and so he, they, he was just changing the water out, but otherwise had no interest in their, their food. Um, he does say, maybe I should add a little, um, water movement from a propeller underneath, but he never does that. And so instead, other researchers take up working on this kind of technological engineering problem. This is a, a rocking beaker by Reese and Russell uh, that they introduced probably about five to 10 years later. And basically, this is just a bunch of beakers. There is um, a board in the middle and it goes back and forth to rock the water just slightly. So this is for smaller jellyfish, but it works relatively well, okay? So we have these two types of technologies and they're joined by people who are questioning what jellyfish actually eat and how their life cycles actually work. So Maud Delap uh, was an Irish naturalist. She actually knew Brown relatively well. He used to go to her island, Valencia Island, um, every year to collect. Her father was a preacher and he would not allow her to go to university and so she just kept in touch with um, Brown basically her whole life. And she's the first person that we know of to have uh, fully raised a jellyfish in captivity. So while she's walking on the beach one day, she collects what we call a, a compass jelly and both of these pictures are from a compass jelly. Um, brings it back to her laboratory and puts it in water and notices the next day that there are small polyps in there. Um, and so she decides to just try to keep it alive. So she tries a bunch of different food um, and eventually finds that jellyfish will eat just about anything. Uh, and I'll show you the list of these things in a minute. Um, the next person, Marie Labor, was also at the Ply Plymouth Laboratory and after the, the Plunger Aquarium, came about, decided now that she could keep jellyfish alive, that she also would look on what they ate. And so she publishes a bunch of papers on feeding techniques very specifically and what they will and will not eat. So this picture on the right is of a compass jelly eating another jellyfish, eating a small fish, and then eating um, a shrimp, which you can kind of see in their bell. But basically she's the first um, to do work on how close the prey has to be before the jellyfish will kind of grab at it. I was super excited. This is obviously not a historical picture, but when I started working on Delap a couple of years ago, I, I don't think anyone was interested. And I was contacted by a museum in Ireland and they said, oh my, oh my gosh, like we've been looking for someone who is working on this woman. Now this is a, a children's book, a children's picture of her, which I was like super excited about when I went to look, so I thought I would put it up because now everyone cares about Maud de Lap, or they should. Um, she writes this in one of her papers, and I'm not gonna read it because my Latin is whew, really rough, um, but these are all of the animals that she finds that the compass jelly will eat, except for the last two. She says there is a medusa and a cenophore that they won't touch. Um, she ends up actually getting the compass jelly through its maturity cycle and it dies because there's a huge storm and she can't go collect food for it, um, which is pretty common actually in aquariums. Um, even today, some people will be like, well, I got this thing really far and then uh, you know, there was a hurricane and I couldn't get food and it, it just died. Um, but her work is published in an Irish nat naturalist journal. Labor's work is published in uh, the journal for the Plymouth Marine Laboratory. Um, and no one really pays that much attention to it. 
uh, but they're the first people uh, to tell you what these animals eat. So there's this big jump between the 1920s and the 1940s. Um, and what happens is that there are a bunch of different places where people are working on jellyfish independently, and most of them are marine stations, really far-flung areas. Um, so Wolf Grieve is working on them in Germany at the Helgeland station, and he develops what is kind of the modern Chrysal tank. Um, and so he, it's not clear that he ever read about Brown's work at all, um, but he puts a um, like air pump in the middle and gravel down at the bottom so that the air is kind of always circulating just a little bit. And this is what's called the chrysal tank. He comes up with something called a plankton chrysal and a phytoplankton chrysal. Um, at the same time that he's doing the work on the technology, there's an enormous amount of work on the husbandry being done in Japan. Um, at a marine station in Japan, uh, Hooray and Kakanuma are growing uh, moon jellies, which are the most common jellies, and they are now the easiest to keep. Um, and they succeed not in just growing them, but they grow them in this little dish with no moving water. Um, and what they do is figure out how to feed them with brine shrimp, right? So you don't always have to go out and collect. You can just grow your own brine shrimp in the laboratory. They also induce strobilation. So jellyfish bud, that's how they become free-swimming little jellyfish. And sometimes they can stay in this kind of stasis for as long as they want to, right? So you might have heard about the immortal jellyfish, which can go backwards in its growth cycle into this little stasis. They'll stay there as long as they want to. To try to get them out of it is very difficult, and they're the first to show that stress kind of pushes them out of that that situation. So if you want to keep jellies in the laboratory, you have to figure out how to get them to, to come out of that stasis, and they do that. They give a lot of this information to Abe Hasada, who are at the UNO Aquarium in Japan, and it's there that they finally close the cycle on jellyfish. You close the cycle when you get a mature jellyfish to, to have um, juvenile jellyfish, and then those juveniles reproduce, right? So we consider that a closed cycle. Why am I telling you all this <laughs> about jellyfish technology? It's okay, you're not Aquarius and that's fine. But one of the things that's really important here is there's the nature of aquarium knowledge creation. Many Aquarists don't cite a wide amount of literature. So for instance, Grieve only has one citation and that's the citation of someone who's working in Russia at the time. Um, and he only has one citation, which is labor, right? That's it. Um, the Japanese citations, even though they're working on what jellyfish eat, they don't cite labor or Delap. They only cite Brown, Reese, and Russell, and only because they're actually going against them, right? So the citations are really hard to figure out here. Why? One of the reasons is that everyone's working at a marine station at this time. And if you're working in those stations, you're only publishing in those marine journals. Um, and you only have access to some of them. No one has access to that Russian journal <laughs> except for like two people at the time in Germany, apparently. But also the nature of the work. What are you citing when you cite labor and tinkering? The only way that you can trace these citations back is through species. So if you're working on the same species, they might cite you, but otherwise they don't care, right? So why does this, how do I, how did I become interested in this? Well, the technology really does take off. Um, and it takes off because of public aquariums. So all of these kind of scattered people that are working through the 80s, they find out about how to keep jellyfish through public aquariums. First, Berlin and Dusseldorf keep uh, jellyfish using the UNO method in 1985. Uh, Dusseldorf specifically combines the plunger jar with uh, the feeding that comes out of Japan, and they successfully keep moon jellies on display. And then the big group gets involved, Monterey. Okay, so in 1986, Monterey shows moon jellies for the first time. 
Um, and there are two people there that start working pretty consistently. Freya Summer, who is in this picture. She's the person in flannel right in the middle. This is literally the only picture of her online that exists. Uh, and David C. Powell. Powell is the engineer. Summer is the husbandry expert. Um, and they work together to figure out how to keep moon jellies. Um, Summer's work is amazing. She is just working on a huge array of jellies that have never been worked on before, and she ends up displaying 14 species. So she goes from one species that consistently can be displayed to knowing the, the food requirements of 14 species. And this is what she comes up with, how long that she can keep them, um, the temperature that they have to be in, uh, the diet they have to be in. And there is a distinction here. UNO actually sends over some of their moon jellies from Japan. And they also find that those jellies, even though they're the most um, geographically wide species in the world, you can find moon jellies all over the world, they react differently in tanks, depending on where you, uh, where you collect them from, which is particularly interesting. She's working with Powell, who updates the Chrysal. He is working with an oceanographer at the UC system, William Hamner, who just loans him one of his tanks. And Powell says, OK, I'll just blow this up, and we'll make it work. He designed tanks for a variety of jellies. Sometimes the intake has to be different, depending on how long their tentacles are. If you have a very large intake, their tentacles will get kind of caught in that valve, and they won't make it. Some jellyfish prefer to sleep on the bottom, especially um, Cassiopeia, and they are they're called upside down jellies, and they need like a different substrate. They don't like the sand. They actually prefer something a little bit different. They were advised by Shimura, who was at an aquarium in Japan, that their lighting need to be very different. Okay. All of these Japanese um, aquarists that I'm talking about are women, right? They just don't exist. They have no paper trail whatsoever that I can tell. So I can't show you a single picture of them. They're just mentioned, and then they, they don't get mentioned anymore. But they're incredibly important to this process. And so Monterey ends up with Planet of the Jellies, which is their large exhibit, where they're showing an enormous amount of jellyfish. They combined this mechanical and husbandry tinkering, and they bring together both sides. And from this point on, people now know where to go to find this information. It's through this kind of clearing house of the public aquarium. Okay. And knowledge spreads. So today, if you want to kill jellyfish in your own home, you can buy that jellyfish tank. <laughs> and in my book, the chapter starts out with all of these Facebook groups where people are like, you told me that I could keep jellyfish at home and they keep dying. What have you done? And then basically, to be able to keep these jellies at home, you have to become an expert, right? You have to learn to tinker because your tank is different than the tank next door, right? Um, on the, in the middle is Rebecca Helm. She runs a laboratory uh, still on, and does some work. She just, her lab figured out how to induce strobilation in, in uh, a bunch more species so that you can keep them in the laboratory. Evolutionary development, Evo Devo, those particular groups have become reinterested in jellyfish as an evolutionary um, form of ex exploring, especially nerves. Um, and then on the other side, Chad Widmer was the person to take over at Monterey, and he wrote this book, How to Keep Jellyfish in Aquariums. What's really, really interesting here um, is that he cites Brown, he cites all, Reeve, he, or Grieve, he cites all of those people. He does not cite Labor, he doesn't cite Delap, and he doesn't cite Summer very much, even though she was his predecessor at um, Monterey. If you wanna learn to keep jellyfish nowadays and you're a public aquarist or a hobbyist, there is a jellyfish school at Monterey that you can go to. So here's where we end, right? What are aquariums teaching us in general? Like, why am I so interested in studying aquariums besides the fact that I get to go hang out in the back of aquariums all the time, which is very exciting? Um, they really show a lot about how marine knowledge is developed, right? Everything that we know about the life cycle of jellyfish we know because we can now keep them in aquariums. And we really know because we've tinkered with their life cycle in aquariums. We would not know that they're on such a lunar cycle. We wouldn't know what induces strobilation. We really wouldn't know what they eat that much unless 
we had watched it in a tank, right? It's really important that we see that because a lot of the people that are developing that knowledge are not in the laboratory. They're not in an academic community per se. They're in these academic adjacent communities or they're, they're no pun intended, kind of floating through them in a very particular way. Um, and so aquariums kind of show us that even today with a non-standardizable system, these kind of communities of information and knowledge remain very important and even more so through climate change and kind of the way that the ocean is changing today, right? So when we look at where we're gonna spend our money, who we're gonna give our money to, and how we think that these research programs are gonna go, it's really important for us to understand that if you give an academic institution billions of dollars to study the ocean, they have to work knowing that there are other communities that they need to be in contact with, right? That money has to go into you know, those networks of knowledge production. Tanks in general kind of studying their history can help us understand how that knowledge is transferred, who's cited and who's published, um, or what is published. A lot of the husbandry stuff you don't see written down. That piece by Freya Summer was published as a um, speech that she gave at the American Zoological Association for public aquarists she has never published anything otherwise, right? And so you can't find that knowledge unless you know where to look for it, and if no one's citing it, it just exists kind of in the ether. Um, however, David Powell and others, Chad Widmer, have published books on their technology, right? So what is getting published is really important here, but it's also really important to see how knowledge movement happens in the beginning of the talk, I talked about how people move knowledge and how you kind of have to see it with tacit knowledge. The one place that I can find where that happens most often is public aquariums. They have institutional kind of grounding. They're here for a very long time. Um, and so if knowledge has to travel through people, there is a space that keeps that knowledge kind of grounded and that's public aquariums. And some of the time what that might mean for us is that we have to think of aquariums as an anchor for marine biological knowledge production. We have tendency to think about it as an anchor for ocean education, and that's useful, but it's something more important than that. And so when we see that it holds a very particular place in marine knowledge, we can kind of think more clearly about how important they are um, and what we wanna do about that in the future. So, thank you very much. All right, Dave Gary, coming to you. Thanks, Sam. This was a wonderful talk. I'm really looking forward to going to the Camden Aquarium with my daughter so you know, to look at the uh, look at the jellyfish again. Uh, but I have a question about sort of earlier research uh, on jellyfish. So you start with 1897 in Brown. Is there any sort of uh, studies about jellyfish earlier by natural scientists of the 18th or 19th century? Yeah. So um, Romanus is really um, obsessed with jellyfish, um, and part of his obsession is that there's such a debate about vivisection going on in the community that he says, if you have a problem with me cutting up jellyfish, um, then you shouldn't eat oysters. I mean, he's just really wretched in the paper, which is a, a little bit hilarious. Um, I write about it a little bit. Um, they're really, really hard to keep alive. And for a long time, um, the majority of these of organisms in general that are being worked with are, are coming off of boats, and jellyfish just kind of disintegrate. So Heckel loves them, he thinks they're super beautiful, but he's drawing them in such a way that he's basically, um, and the way everyone is kind of drawing them is that they're getting word from what people saw on the boat, and then just kind of extrapolating from the color that people said that they were, et cetera. Um, and so it's not until a while later, probably Romanus is one of the first that we see people using them. Um, and I wrote a paper on it and it was really funny because they do these things which they call mutilation experiments um, where um, they're trying to figure out 
how jellyfish nerves work, and so they cut them into you know what you would imagine a, a child does to to make a snowflake, right? And then they shock the bell on one side, and you can cut them into any shape, and eventually that shock will get all the way to the other side of the bell. It it'll just go backwards and forwards until it get it finds that pathway. Um, they become very popular through World War I because of that, and there are some people in Florida that are doing shell shock experiments. So um, Alfred Goldsboro Mayer has this really, I just imagine him down there just like trying to figure out what he can do for the war effort, but he decides that he wants to see if shell shock is for nerve damage or a nervous condition. And so he takes jellyfish and he puts them into bags and he just throws dynamite at them. And if they don't explode, he just takes them out of the bags and sees if they can swim correctly. And he finds that they can. And so he says, whatever, it's a Freudian condition, right? Because if the jellyfish live, like they don't seem to have nerve damage. I just, sometimes uh, I'm in my tenure year and I think, man, I really wish I was a scientist back then. I definitely would have had tenure. Um, <laughs> These are the these are the the bitter things we think, but like, um, so that it ends though about that time the obsession with jellyfish and now it's come back. So um, I was at the European Conference for Evolutionary Development a couple of years ago, um, and now nearly everyone's working with jellyfish. And part of that is because you can keep them now consistently, and part of that is because. Um, people are going back to invertebrates in a different way. But my general argument there is that it's just because you can keep them, right? And it's much easier. Um, but that's probably the earliest. I know it's about 1880s. Um, anything earlier than that, it's pretty impossible to keep them. Other questions? And I should say, if folks online have questions, we welcome those as well. <laughs> Hi, thank you, Sam. That was, that was, that was a very interesting talk. I, I didn't know that I'd be so interested in jellyfish and uh, the keeping of the same, you know. Um, but my question is more about possibly the physiology of uh, jellyfish. I have a few questions I'd like to ask of you, if you don't mind. <clears throat> to start, you talked about um, that what it is that they eat. Yeah. Frankly, looking at a jellyfish, I never saw a mouth. <laughs> and yeah. I'm, I'm wondering whether, I mean, does this species have what's recognizably a mouth like other fish do? Or does it imbibe it, it, food from its skin? Does it have, and because it's tra relatively transparent, can you watch its digestive system and see if there are enzymes that yeah. break, et cetera, et cetera? And then I'd like you, if I might, ask about what you mentioned as budding in reproduction. Awesome, yeah, uh, it's so funny because when I give talks, I'm never, I'm never sure if I should do just like a here's how jellyfish work talk, which is, uh, I, it took me a really long time. So I'll start with the first, which is actually how they reproduce because it's very useful, and then I'll talk about how they eat. Um, jellyfish, and, and actually quite a few marine invertebrates do two forms of reproduction. Uh, jellyfish are sexually, they do sexually reproduce, and so they release gametes into the water that are fertilized, and then when that fertilization occurs, they settle into uh, a polyp. It kind of looks like a tiny plant, right? So it needs the substrate, and that's where it can sit for an extreme period of time, right, as a polyp. And then um, when it feels like it, it will bud into an aphyra, which is like a little swimming organism. Over time, it grows into a medusa. That is the big one that you're used to seeing. Um, so that's the way that it reproduces. Some jellyfish, like I said, the immortal jellyfish can go back into its polyp form, um, but not all jellies can do that. And not all jellies are jellies. So. Um, some of the species that you're probably more um, aware of are actually something called siphonophores, which are um, the man of war and the by the the sea sailor. So the, they're called like they're little blue discs, and they have a little 
um, top on them and actually the wind carries them. And I was saying, uh, uh, man of wars and uh, by the sea sailors, they cannot pulsate. They can't move at all except for however the ocean is moving them. So I always imagine when you're being stung by a man of war, like it's really embarrassed because it's just like, oh God, I can't get away, right? Uh, it makes me feel a lot better, but like just, it's not going to help anyone in that moment, but just know it's, it's struggling too, <laughs> okay? Um, but like, they are actually not one organism. They're multiple organisms. They're a colony, right? So one of them is the stinger. One of them is this other part, right? So the, um, the kind of budding and all of that stuff, that's kind of a regular kind of jellyfish, as I would call it. Um, they eat... They, a lot of uh, jellies have stinging tentacles or some part of their body stings, and it allows them to kind of slowly move food towards their, what would be a stomach, a cloaca, right? So it's a single opening, the food goes in, they digest it, and then anything that they can't digest, they just, they just flush, like flush out later. Um, and depending on what jellyfish it is, you can most often, yeah, see their digestion process. Um, and so um, there's some really beautifully kind of like over time pictures that Labor produces of like the fish and then the fish four hours later and then it's up here and now it's here, right? Um, it makes it really useful. Um, the big problem is with jellies is they do create a lot of, um, they make the water not so clean because of that, and so the nitrogen levels have to be tinkered with a lot. Partially because when jellyfish get, uh, they, when they are in contact with anything near them anyways, they produce jelly, basically. They produce this mucus that they just throw off of their body, um, and it can choke them if they're in an aquarium environment. And some of that just happens naturally while they're eating, right? But then, of course, anything that that is not digestible, or anything that is digestible has to come out in the water, and that can be a big problem too. And so all of those are reasons why jellies are really hard to keep, right? The um, life cycle means that you usually have to have a different tank for the polyps, for the ephyra, and then for the adult jelly. Not only because the adult jelly will eat any other juvenile ephyra that are floating about, but also because the water requirements are different. The water um, movement at the bottom of the ocean where you're on a substrate and you just look like a plant is totally different than a moon jelly that moves on top of the water. And so there's at least three tanks involved in closing the cycle of those jellies. Uh, okay, we have, I think, maybe time for, I see one other question, so we'll do two more questions. So um, Christopher asks, um, are any of your findings uh, ap applicable to zoos? I actually had a similar question, particularly about the husbandry, animal yeah. husbandry versus tinker culture, gender dynamic. It's really hard. I'm always like, aquariums aren't zoos, right? And part of that is just because there's so many zoo historians in comparison. And people will be like, well, we already did it, right? And I always say there's a big difference between a tiger and a tiger shark, which is like, <laughs> that's my go-to. Um, in some sense, yes, and in some sense, no. So zoos um, have not a longer history, but so here are two differences. Uh, one is they are not quite so integral to the science, okay? So we can observe terrestrial animals in their, uh, in, like in their environments most of the time without keeping them in captivity. And so that's one of the reasons that often when information is developed through zoos, it's known as kind of information that comes from zoos, right? It is biology of captive organisms and not biology of that organism in general. We don't have as much of a distinction in aquariums as we do in zoos, and part of that is because um, the animals are very different, but part of it is we wouldn't know, <laughs> right? Like, we just wouldn't know. Some things maybe, <clears throat> and we're getting better um, at understanding that distinction, so if someone views something in a tank, they'll often try to get that response in a wild organism and see if that occurs. But that's really, really hard to do in most instances. Um, and so one is that I would personally say that 
that through my work, and I also work on the ethics of zoos and aquariums. I have a couple papers on the ethics of um, captive cetaceans that I work with an ethicist who I'm also married to, just, um, <laughs> just, just so that it doesn't, so you don't find out and be like, she lied to me. <laughs> um, but so, you know, it changes the ethics a little bit to have an animal in captivity because you can't do it otherwise. And so when you lump those two together, aquariums I think are more integral to the way that we understand that environment and those animals. We just can't do it otherwise right now. Um, the other thing is, is mostly um, there, there is less of a distinction about charismatic megafauna in aquariums as zoos. So, um, Zoos require, you know, there used to be the saying, Philadelphia Zoo, oldest zoo in America, that if you don't have an elephant, you don't have a zoo, right? It's not quite the same these days, although zoos do keep elephants still. Um, but aquariums never say that. They're, if you go to a different aquarium, there's other things that are exciting to people. The piranha feeding is very exciting to people. Alligator feeding is very exciting. Penguins. But not every aquarium has the same thing. And the reason is because they primarily run on a different kind of wonder. And that has a lot to do with the technology. So when the Shedd Aquarium opened in 1930, thousands of people stood in line on Thanksgiving to see those tanks without water in them, right? Because they were that wondrous to them. Um, at, the Phil, or at the St. Louis Exposition, uh, the Pennsylvania exhibit, the fish died every single day because the water was so hard to keep fish in, and people still would go in every single day. They'd look at a single snapping turtle, right? So like aquariums, it's harder to extrapolate because there's something about seeing an environment that is just not accessible to the human body in the same way. So we can extrapolate a little bit about tinkering and things like that, but not even as much uh, in that instance. So they're very, they're almost completely opposite in my personal opinion. Very quick question. Yes, uh, in many years ago, not recently, I used to go swimming at night in the ocean and encounter these luminous bodies, and it just fascinated me. And I just always wondered, uh, are they jellyfish or they're something, are they something else? But, uh, and you would disturb them and then, then they would light up and go out. This is actually funny because I think we swam in a bioluminescent sea once. <laughs> um, it could be anything. So jellies, some of them are bioluminescent. Um, coral, one of the reasons that people start to keep coral in captivity is because they realize kind of accidentally that they bioluminesce. Um, and then there's a lot of plankton that bioluminesce as well. So I'm assuming that's plankton. Um, what's really interesting is um, figuring out how to see it in a tank <laughs> and then kind of figuring out how to induce it all the time. Um, the aquariums that I've been in, one of the really cool things is um, that they keep them on a day cycle. So another thing, zoos, you know, you can just rely on the outside to be the outside, but in an aquarium, um, you actually have to have it so there's a 24 hour cycle in each different tank uh, for where they're supposed to be in the world. So the um, coral and all of the other animals that are supposed to be in the Indo-Pacific are on a different 24-hour cycle than the ones that are supposed to be in the Atlantic. Um, and when you look at that, it's super beautiful, but the, the kind of um, tinkering is so much harder for that, and it's super uh, interesting to see. Sometimes when those systems go wrong, not even through tinkering, but just because they fail, that's when you find out that an animal that you didn't realize was bioluminescent is, um, or you figure out what their kind of inducement to reproduce is. And so occasionally, if you guys open the paper, they'll be like, oh, this zoo or this aquarium got um, a fish that had never you know, spawned before to spawn. And if you really read it closely, you'll realize it was an accident. <laughs> like, like the heater was like two degrees higher or two degrees colder and accidentally this fish was induced to spawn. Um, and so like bioluminescence in the, in the laboratory was almost accidental in some of these species. And then people got so excited, they started to keep them for that exact reason. Well, I suspect many of us are going to head to the aquarium this weekend. So, um, Sam, thank you so much. This has really been delightful. Thank you.